Okay. Hi everyone, welcome to our psychosomatic conversations. And today we are sharing some strategies around sleep and having a really good night's sleep. Many people struggle with this issue. And it's a topic that Christy, Sean, and I have discussed many times around um, clients, even ourselves. And we're going to share some of our insights and the importance of how you can actually change your relationship with sleep. So I am going to ask Christy first. Christy, as we start, what would be um, two of your personal strategies that you use for getting a better night's sleep? Well, I first and foremost, for me, if I can exercise in the day, preferably in the morning and or take a walk at nighttime, that helps tremendously because if I'm not exercising in whatever form, I my body doesn't work as well. And then I go to bed and it just, for me, I don't sleep as well. And when I have a regular routine where I am being active through the day, it really helps my body settle at nighttime. And the other thing that I have done for many years is like, look, uh, we were talking about listening to uh, something right before the call started. I will put in earbuds where it blocks out all sound for me. And sometimes I'll put an eye mask over. So I take that sense away too. And I will listen to a body scan meditation that settles my brain and puts it onto something else. And those are the two main ones that I know if I'm not sleeping, I can check, especially exercise, because sometimes I'll go in spurts where I don't, and it, it'll it affect my sleep probably more than anything, is not moving through the day. Right. Those are my two for sure. Ooh. Sure. Yes. Sleep and I eventually became good friends. Um, mm. It was definitely a relationship that I had to create. Um, I guess for me, it's ritual or healthy habits around sleep. Um, I use essential oils and a variety of essential oils. I like to put them on the soles of my feet before I go to sleep. Um, I find that that influences the body, but it also um, introduces a thread that the body recognizes as sleep mode. And, and for me, um, mental health is something that, um, I found dexterity around eventually. And when I say mental health, it's really about noticing what my brain believes it's trying to achieve and then reverting myself back into my physical body. So my relationship before I go to sleep is directly with either my heartbeat um, my flesh, because whatever the mind is working on um, can't be solved or won't be solved because a mind will always continue to uh, want to explore itself. So switching from that mental mode back into flesh mode. Nice, really nice. Mm -hmm. For me, Probably the most significant sleep strategies I used to find many years ago, particularly when I was in the corporate world, that if I was busy, my mind would, no matter when I would wake up, it was like I was having conversations in my head. And when I was awake, it was difficult to get back to sleep. So the most significant thing was firstly, giving myself permission that it was okay not to be asleep because I'd stress at the fact that I had a really busy day coming and that itself would create 
a more of a disturbance to allow myself to sleep. So in that process to then actually just start doing some really deep relaxing, relaxing techniques with, um, with my breath, like body scans, which we're going to go through later. That was, that was really, really helpful. And I went from not sleeping very well at all to sleeping through the night. Um, I don't always sleep through the night, but that's definitely my number one strategy. And I think the beliefs around um, sleep are so important because you often hear clients and um, we all are seeing clients, we all hear the different stories, but there can be some really strong beliefs around sleep. Mm. Yeah. So we're going to just, whilst, uh, whilst you're listening to this, if you have a, a chance just to write down or to think about what are some of your personal beliefs about sleep? and about your ability to sleep. Christy, what do you find with your with your clients around sleep? What kind of what kind of things are being said when your client comes in and is having difficulty with sleeping? Usually there is a um something happening in their life that they're not able to solve. That's probably the biggest thing, or they have been in a space of complete chaos. It most often it's a mental piece of wanting to solve something. And then what I'll hear is now I, the language is so specific. Now I know I'm not going to be able to sleep because of blank. And what I, what I hear so often is the, the setting up of the unconscious mind in our bodies to say, I know I'm not going to be able to sleep because of this piece. And it's almost like, like I would describe it as there, there's, they're leaking energy. And I've certainly done it. Please know that too, of, of this thing that they want to be able to solve and we can't solve it at nighttime. And so what I will talk to them about, which we're going to go through today, are to create some rituals around letting the body know that it's time for sleep and we can place, place that on the nightstand, for example, and then come into ritual and start to get the body ready for bed, ready for sleep. And um we'll we'll be going through quite a few of those things. But the biggest piece one that I hear is the programming that I, kn I know I'm not going to be able to sleep. And I would agree with them. Yeah. As long as that is what's happening. And, and we're saying that to reframe that language. And like you said, Linda, giving yourself permission, I being aware that you might not be able to sleep and my body is going to be able to rest. So to reframe some of those hard statements so we have a bridging statement of a little more wiggle room in what that sleep could be. Otherwise, it's like terror even thinking you have to go to sleep because you know you can't. Yeah. Before you even go to bed and that, it, it can be so stressful. I love the way you said um, solve as well, solve the problem, which is, you know, for us in psychosomatics, it's very masculine. And obviously the sleep state, state is more the feminine aspect and um, allowing the parasympathetic nervous system to kick in, um, slow the body down, slow the mind down. I love that. Sean, how about you? I guess what I notice um, about my clients is um, their relationship to the disturbance. And whether that's a mental disturbance, whether it's an emotional disturbance, or whether it's physical discomfort. Yeah. Either way, each of those aspects of who we are require me in one way or another to subdued uh, solve. Well, I'm using the word solve um, in a way that is about consolidating. So um the body will often feel threatened by a disturbance within us and we need to notice that we can allow a disturbance 
to be present, yet the disturbance doesn't need to interrupt my sleep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because um, the body is an organic process. There is something occurring within us at any given point in time, and we need to be able to um, reclaim this process so I can rejuvenate, so I can restore. I think as well the whole concept of the emotional body and how someone's being with the emotions, whether they make time to process emotions during the day because it is this the time of day where the emotions particularly come out to play. And if someone maybe has some challenges around sitting with their emotions, that's usually when you're going to notice that the evening sleep is going to be more disturbed. Um, so to make time during the day to actually consider, you know, what's actually going on for me, how am I feeling about the day, rather than being so busy throughout the whole day and leading up to bed that um, you really haven't had time to to allow that processing to occur. Or feeling as if you've been unable to um, coexist with the day or participate with the day, which means there's a build-up before you go to sleep because the day hasn't necessarily been internally debriefed or expressed or understood, um, and that creates um, unrest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The body's a little bit like a child as well. It needs to have that nurturing attention. And even, even if that is only for five or 10 minutes of connection before bed, that five or 10 minutes makes such a big difference. Yeah. Well, sleep has, has its own habits and has its own unconscious learnings and we've experienced that in utero as well as um as well as in our formative years and um sleep is something that's been encouraged around us towards us for us hopefully and and therefore um how do we surround ourselves now when we go to sleep yeah. So, Chrissy, do you want to talk about the rituals? Because rituals are incredibly important around sleep. And there's many different styles of sleep issues that people have. So we're just looking at some of the issues that people have. But the first part is if someone is really wanting to change their relationship with sleep, they're changing the relationship with themselves and their habits. And uh, rituals are incredibly important. Christy, what would you yeah. share about to rituals? Thank you. First of all, we all are creatures of habit and we all have rituals. And it becomes such an un- unconscious piece that we don't even realize it. And so part of what you can begin to create at nighttime is a very conscious ritual because it does let the body know it's time for sleep. Uh, when my boys were tiny, I was very anal granted. I so admit that about ritual because I wanted them to sleep. And so I would feed them a nice little meal, give them a bath. We'd read a story. I would put like Sean was saying, I would put little, uh, essential oils on their feet every night. Sometimes we'd listen to music and it was that way every night as best I could for a long time. And as they've grown up, that's shifted because of phones and computers. And so that's really why this is so important to bring that back in because so many of us plug into media and phones and TV And to create a ritual is shutting some of that back down so the body can get ready to sleep. So one of the things that is helpful if you've had a stressful day is you can, I'm going to just give you some ideas. You could journal. Some people love to do some light reading, preferably not some, uh, for me, I know if I open a book about self-help, which I love, that's not a good idea then my brain is on. So it's something very light reading that doesn't require mental, any mental capacity is helpful. Um, 
taking a bath or a shower before bed to wash the day off and or even washing your feet starts to prepare the body to slow down and we're getting back in touch with the body and coming out of our minds and out of whatever that your day was. Um, really important pieces start is changing into comfortable clothing, getting out of your work clothes, um, putting on something that is soft and relaxing for you to wear. So there's no constriction in your clothing. I use meditations at nighttime when I get in bed and that's part of my ritual. There's many slow down yoga, like a 10 minute stretching, breathing ritual where hopefully we brush our teeth before bed. I know if I don't brush my teeth and wash my face, I think about it in the night. I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm going to get a cavity and, or what's going to happen to my skin. It's so crazy to me that that is so important for me to have that consistently be part of my bedtime routine is to wash my face and brush my teeth and wear something comfortable. I'm so used to that now. I really don't sleep if I don't have it. Um, and when I do get in bed, I'm very conscious of feeling my body in the bed, feeling the weight of my body in the bed. And we'll go through a little bit later today, um, a body scan, but to actually be aware of your body versus the thoughts of the day, scrolling on my phone, looking at a computer, looking at a TV, to slow all of that down and close it out. And the ritual is literally coming back in, into my body and being aware that it's time for to put that away and allow the day to be what it was. And this next six to eight hours is mine. And the rituals start the process of that slowing down. It's probably mm -hmm. one of the most important things I can emphasize is to create a ritual and choose one or two things and try them for 30 days. One day won't work. You need to try them for a few days. So your body, you're training your body that it start, it's time to slow down and come into a space of rest. The part of that moving from the external world to the internal world um, highlights for me at times where being with my internal world was also not a place I wanted to be. So then you have this straddle between outside and inside and not really knowing um, where to be or safely to be. And that coming inward is also the the remarkable nature of where we can restore what has been activated, overactivated, impacted um, in one way or another, um, that calling inward is the personal work that is essential um, that creates a restful place. So um, if there are personal uh, processes that are there, um, getting assistance on working resolution around those places and spaces uh, is something to really consider because that haven, that sanctity, um, that sacred place within ourselves um, where we like being where we are um, and we like being with who we are and mm. especially the desire to be who I am um, is something that uh, is now a place where I go, yeah, I'm going to bed um, because I have a moment that's uninterrupted, that's that's my world. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm intrigued with who I am. I'm interested in who I am. I'm um, 
I'm curling up with who I am. Yeah. I think it's really important as well to take a look at what habits people currently have mm. and habits may not be serving. Mm. Um, you know, I love having conversations with people and not assuming that everyone does the same as me around, um, you know, what they actually do. And leading up to this uh, call, I just decided to ask a few people just to hear what they said about their sleeping habits and routines. And, you know, I was really surprised that, you know, some people literally get up in the night, they reactivate their their body. Some of them don't go to bed till after midnight on some days. Um, and, of course, everyone's different, but the body does like to have certain routines and particularly when it's being retrained into doing something new and to actually know this is my time, this is time for rejuvenation, rest. And, you know, if I look back in, in my history over the years, you know, I used to wake up in the morning and look at my emails and, you know, I'd have several emails from myself that had appeared during the night when I was actually thinking about some some problems. So I would problem solve and do creative thinking in the night and send myself emails. Um, it is important to work out what works. And sometimes, you know, for me, that was actually sometimes a strategy to get something out of my mind. However, you know, now as, I, as I've changed the relationship with sleep, um, I really give myself the opportunity to write down some notes beforehand um, to you know, consider if there's anything on my mind that could keep me awake. Um, I've reframed from sending myself emails during the night <laughs> and using it more as a sleep time. Yeah. And I also used to have people contacting me during the night. And I think it's really relevant for younger people because um, there's a lot of anxiety with, you know, teenage teenagers particularly and probably even younger than teenagers mm -hmm. where their their phone is on the whole night and they're getting alerts during the night. And even if they don't get alerts, the phone is on to receive alerts. And yeah. if the body knows that it might receive a message, um, it doesn't fall into the same level as sleep as when the phone is off completely. So there are there are ways in which the phones, particularly I think iPhones, I could be wrong, I don't know if it's on all phones, where you can actually do, if it's really, really urgent, that people can still contact you um, and it's it's really good to take a look at what functions your phone may have or an alternative. But keeping the phone off, keeping technology off, turning the Wi-Fi off can be really helpful for sleep as well. And some people, Linda, when I suggest that too, they get panicked mm. that their phone will be off. And a suggestion, because I don't have an iPhone, just uh, a Android, and there are you can set it up so your alarm will still go off and that there's emergency numbers. If something happens, they can call, but all of the other um, notifications are shut down. My boys had issues. They don't as much anymore, thank God, but in high school, they would put their phones under their pillows and it was constant and it's so important. That's its own battle, we'll talk another day but they have come to this space now where they do put on those notifications. So because they, they were so sleep deprived, it wasn't even, they couldn't function in the day and our phones have become part of us Yeah, and they don't need to control our sleep. And I think even when people wake up in the night to get on their phone restarts the brain again. So to try something else, and you can still have it by your bed for your alarm. I don't even have an alarm clock anymore. I have my phone, but I do shut down what I need to shut down because otherwise I'm, I'm anticipating, like you said, Linda, if I know it's on, I'm anticipating and it doesn't even mean something will come through. Our bodies are very smart in what they already are aware of, of what might happen. Especially if there's been trauma and things like that. Um, that hypervigilance um, mm -hmm. and the overactivation of that hypervigilance um, when that energy is needed to um, return to the self-magnetism, to look back in, to stay within, uh, to remain within, 
uh, in order to have restorative sleep. Yeah. Also watching, you know, what you're watching or listening to before you go to bed, that is so, so, so important. Um, at any point in time, I can't do scary. Like I am someone who cannot watch scary movies. Um, it doesn't matter if it's during the day or, or at nighttime, but I have to be really mindful of what I'm listening to before I go to bed. Um, otherwise I'll have horrendous dreams and it will show up in, in that state. So I've also noticed if, if I'm sort of watching more um, or listening to relaxing more um, feel good kind of things, it works better for me, but everyone's going to be different. So, you know, some of the suggestions that we're going to talk to you about is, you know, to play with what works for you because what works for us may not work for your body. But if you could take a moment to write down a couple of things about your sleeping habits and what sleeping habits work well for you currently and maybe which ones don't work well. And that would be what time What time do you go to bed at night? Mm. What do you do if you wake up during the night? What are some of the things that you do? You know, I hear about people sometimes getting up and doing some housekeeping cleaning the house in the middle of the night because they can't sleep i've done that before <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i don't think it's helpful but i was I gonna say it's productive before. for the house but not productive for the body <laughs> not productive no but i have done that mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's the um the deliberation noticing how you deliberate how you um, work with conflict and how you um, come to a point of full comprehension and understanding for that internalization to take place I know when things were quite horrific for myself um, I was listening to um breath work exercises um, just because my own train of thought was um, so erratic or so disturbed that I needed an influence um, because obviously every other part of me um, was in disarray. So I needed um, a comforting, guiding voice that was enabling something else mm -hmm. for me at that point in time until I became proficient myself and was able to um, commit to that and um, appreciate it and utilise it as a, um, as a required resource when necessary rather than a definite habit because um, definite habits are still being enforced rather than... Um, noticing what's required yeah 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 and alcohol is a really interesting alcohol and caffeine and chocolate that's a really really interesting thing to look at as well um, um, relative to your body's diet yeah yeah one of my family members that they had the um something similar to like a fitbit but measuring their sleep mm -hmm. and what they noticed was when they had alcohol particularly red wine that the deep sleep was dramatically affected when they when they were going for a couple of weeks off alcohol. So they don't actually they've actually removed alcohol completely mm. based on such huge changes in the deep sleep uh, with that removal. Mm. Yes, life in moderation. Mm -hmm. A little bit of everything. Yeah. So one of the other questions we get asked about is, you know, I, I get up to go to the bathroom all the way through the night. So Christy, Sean, do you want to give some insights into that? Psychosomatic insights. Oh, bladder. Mm. Mm. Um, a highly emotive organ um, relative to anxiety through to fear, panic, Um the bladder is about wanting to expel emotions and 
um, there are mechanics around it um, with regards to if you've drunk a liter of fluid before you go to bed, um, inevitably that fluid is going to um, find its way out. And um, and so noticing your fluid intake uh, relative to your um, bladder condition. Uh, and I, I have quite a few clients that actually don't drink liquid after a certain time at night mm -hmm. um, because they are aware of the effects. And that's a lot to do with the um, muscle integrity around the bladder and being able to uh, strengthen that muscle activity around the bladder. Um, and that's about being able to contain an emotion or uh, be with an emotion for uh, its journey, its process of what it needs to express and um, and or that flight response, um, anxiety, panic, those things um, also change the integrity of the bladder. Christy. Yeah, well said. I have many, I would say, older women that I see that have issues with their bladder and especially a lot of them with that have had babies. Mm -hmm. And so what they do to manage that too, is to stop drinking like at eight o'clock PM mm -hmm. because of the integrity of the bladder, it cannot hold the liquid. And then they're stressed when they go to bed, if they drink it, that they know they're going to have to get up and go to the bathroom which creates its own cycle before they even ever get in bed. And so if that is you, and I would say a lot of that is directly related to anxiety, Sean, like you were saying, there is a emotional component to that. If I'm thinking of the people who have that. Um, so the importance of the ritual of relaxation, stopping your water early to start to settle the nervous system would probably be one of the most important pieces to someone that has bladder issues at nighttime, because it can be, um, extremely stressful long, yeah. for years. If you don't look at the components of what are you worrying about working on that, creating a ritual around your water, taking it, um, a lot earlier and, giving yourself some room to be human too, because if you've had a lot of babies, it does affect your bladder. Mm, That's yes. just true. The pelvic floor. Yeah. Reset, yes. And sometimes um, people are really unaware of the direct relationship between the fluid representing the emotions as well. The yes. The emotions and as Sean said as well, the ability to hold on to emotions. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually seeing some younger uh, clients that are having um, significant issues, and yeah. I think it's really it's really important to actually um, you know create that awareness of how it can change as someone changes their relationships with their feelings of their own um, emotions, and if they're suffering from anxiety, to do a first check of. Um, do I really need to go or am I feeling like I need to go and actually just holding for another half an hour just be, you know, before actually just automatically getting up, um, doing a check-in with the body to see if it is uh, physical, that they actually do need to go or whether or not it's actually more at an emotional level. Uh, we notice that in, you know, as teachers of psychosomatics, we'll have students that will come in that will be going to the bathroom every 40 to 45 minutes because we're talking deep emotional topics and that desire to um, to relieve themselves, to pass through the emotions rather than to feel the emotions is really strong. By the end of the training, that can change to going, you know, three times a day. So we see that um, so significantly with the type of work that we do. Mm. Yeah, it's the expelling yeah. of an emotion, the um, reaction to an emotion that's in us that we'd rather not have or would rather 
um, it'd be elsewhere. So that expulsion of that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And at a physical level as well, like it is, I think, really important, um, you know, if, if you're a gentleman and you're watching this and you're going to the bathroom a lot of times during the night, it's always good to get a medical checkup because sometimes things can be changed and assisted, but the prostate particularly, um, mm-hmm. it's an early detector that something could be um, out of balance that you need to get checked up. So we would encourage that that as well. Yeah. Yeah, that does happen. Yeah, whether that's by the enlargement of the prostate or whether that's by um, inflammation of the prostate, two different things, um, two different influences. Um, yeah, and finding approaches to uh, restoring that. Yeah. So I'm thinking maybe we should take a look at... Um doing a bit of a process should we start with your heart your heart um, meditation christy sure so this is one that uh comes from the heart math institute it's a heart brain coherence breath and i do this if i'm noticing that my anxiety is present during the day as well I love doing it at nighttime. If I've had something happen in the day that I can't get my brain to stop looping, it helps me to interrupt that loop, which is why I really appreciate this process. So what I'd like everyone to do, if you're comfortable to close your eyes for a minute, put one hand on your lower belly and one hand on your heart space. And how we begin with this is as best you can to begin to breathe into the belly and count your breath. So if you breathe into three or four, you're going to add two or three more counts to your out breath. So you're going to breathe in and then on your out breath, add two or three more counts and it can be whatever your system is most comfortable with. So you're you're feeling the hand on your lower, lower belly move up with your in breath and move down with your out breath. And then the breath goes out even one or two more counts. And you want to do that for at least a minute, connecting with that breath. And then what you're going to do is to bring your awareness into your heart space. And you have one hand on your heart and begin to connect with the feeling or the emotion of gratitude and or love for one thing or one person and bring them into your heart space and connecting with what it feels like to love, what it feels like to feel grateful. And you can add two or three things in this gratitude practice of what it feels like versus what you think. When we speak about love, we put our hands on our heart. And that's what we're doing is connecting with the feeling and the emotion of gratitude, of love, and come back to that breath. So you're doing two things at the same time. You're noticing the breath going in, adding a couple counts to the out breath, feeling your body relax on the out breath feeling your legs and your inner thighs relax, your feet, your shoulders. And then you're doing an in-breath and then connect to that feeling and emotion of gratitude. And that is it. The exercise is that simple. It will help to reset your nervous system in a very short amount of time. And especially at nighttime in bed, at 3 a.m. It takes you out of your brain, into your body and into your heart space. And I think we can all find one thing that we're grateful for, even if it's the bed we're in, the blanket that's on top of us, the roof that's over us. Keep it very, very simple. The whole idea is to bring it back to simplicity. 
Beautiful, Christy. I'm going to also give you a slightly different version of uh, what Christy has um, guided you through. And this one is imagine that you're in bed to feel yourself being supported by your bed and imagine that is also a representative of Mother Earth. And just to notice whether you're tense, if any part of your body has any kind of pain or tension, and just to notice. And then to bring awareness to your breath and notice what parts of your body are moving with your breath. And as you notice, your breath might be in the throat or the, you might notice it in the back of your neck. Just to invite the movement of the lower part of your neck being invited to breathe in with you. So as you breathe in, you're bringing your awareness and your attention to the back of the neck and see whether or not your shoulders could move a little bit and just in, to invite in that movement. And as you invite in that movement, you're bringing sensation to that area. If you're noticing any different, to invite that breath into the thoracic, the back. Take a breath in and see if the thoracic could be invited to move and participate within this process of relaxing. And then to take it down further into the lumbar. And just notice if the lumbar can be invited into the process. And just coming up a little bit back up to the chest area. Notice the side of your rib cage, the front of your rib cage. And notice if there's any difference in the movement of your rib cage. And then come down into the lower back. Visualize, visualize your breath going into this area. You might notice there's a bit of movement as well with that part of your body. Just to notice, not to force any change, just to really gently massage your spine with your breath. And as you do this, to now take a look at the your stomach, the internal organs. Notice if there's any difference from where you're noticing your breath is entering through your body. And then scanning all the way down to your feet and imagine the excess energy coming out through your feet. And when you breathe in, the earth energy just Gently calming, relaxing your body in order for you to get the right environment for a restful sleep. And just notice if even with that, the two brief processes that Christy and I did, just notice if your body is feeling any different, hopefully a little bit calmer. Sean, do you want to add any tips into that one? Reconnecting with your body is reconnecting within you. Mm. And the slower that you can do that and with more intrigue that you do that, and fascination, then you're re-establishing an internal connection, which in turn will override an external connection. And when people are doing body scans, they may notice at times that there's parts of their body they can't feel. So don't be too concerned initially if you can't feel a part of your body, 
still bring your awareness to that part that feels a little bit numb, that doesn't feel like it's quite taking in the energy and the scan in the same way. And the same way that you would a frightened child, just to notice it, hold space for that, still continue to breathe into that area of your body. Because the more you practice this in the same way as a ritual, the greater the connection will be with the body that you're starting to notice a part that maybe before you've bypassed. One thing that I've noticed too, that's helpful. I notice with my body, if I am feeling stressed, the, the arches of my feet will feel tight in bed. So I will take some essential oils and rub the arch of the foot gently but with enough pressure that I can feel it and rub and go through each one of the toes in psychosomatics, the toes represent the brain and the mind, and it helps to settle my feet because it, my brain is on. And that's also really helpful. And then I'll do a body scan as one of those pieces, because the more that I've been in touch with psychosomatics, I am really a, acutely aware when I get in bed of where it hurts or where I'm contracted. And if people are having sleep issues to maybe start paying attention to that and find a smell or a lotion without a smell that you can gently touch or massage that area to bring awareness and then invite the breath into that space. I have found that's been very helpful for me as, as I've worked with my sleep, it's much better than it used to be. I was on sleep meds for years and I haven't been on them for a long time, but it took a while. And these little things made a world of difference for me. Yeah. The mental, what I call content and our visceral response to the presence of the nature of those thoughts um, rather than feel as if you need to change the thoughts so the body responds differently um, mm -hmm. it's recognizing that if the body is overreacting to what's within our mental scope then the body needs to be protected from the mind the body needs to know that it can safely exist even though we're having a thought. Yeah. And safety is such a key word there, Sean. Yeah. It's, um, the body has the right to be safe from what we're thinking. And thank you, Fiona. And if there is pain in the body, um, Alleviating the pain sometimes can be a mechanical, physical experience, whether that's putting pillows in between legs, um, whether that's making sure that the, the pillow underneath your head and neck are just right, whether your mattress is supporting you correctly. There's all these other mechanics that are there rather than go too far into that. Um, when there is a part of our body that goes into that hypertension, um, then we need to find ways to be able to calm and soothe that because there can be times where we have symptoms where organs become inflamed. There are symptoms where we become ill in one way or another. And we need to ensure that the body has the right to let that change because so often um we would rather remove something that's painful rather than actually assist it in its change and even bringing your breath into that pain like literally take a look at the part that's got pain in it and feel like you're breathing into that area um, checking in with that part just to see 
if you get any insights as to what the pain could be representing for you. Um, and I guess that's where psychosomatics comes in. A lot of stress and anxiety will show up as pain. Um, so to just to be very present with that. One of the areas that people complain a lot about pain in is their digestive system. And physically, there can be some really good things to take a look at, even if it's for short periods of time, removing anything that can create um, too much infl um, inflammation in the body, the size of the meals at the nighttime. And, you know, we'd, we'd really invite anyone to play a little bit with changing up their traditional routines and to doing something different. You know, maybe for 28 days going on a like a celiac style of diet where you're just having, you know, more, um, but, you know, vegetables and the, the really unprocessed foods just to get a sense of changing that up to see what that looks like, which may require a nutritionist as well. But yeah. And, and I guess for chronic pain as well, um, I used to find um, if I'm lying on my back with pillows underneath my knees, um, it's a it's a yoga position called Shavasana, um, but it also helps alleviate pressure in the body or pressure around the body, um, and therefore that helps alleviate pain that can be occurring that um and pain has its uh, necessary reason and purpose and more often than not um the the pain is inferring an emotional response to an impact so it's really looking at the behavior that's residing within that. Christy, allowing that to be able to disperse. Christy, would you like to add to that? Yeah, with one other exercise in that position where you're lying on your back with some pillows under your feet to actually take your feet and move them like this for a couple minutes while you breathe actually relaxes the legs too. And it moves energy out of the legs, especially when there's, um, it's been a busy day and sometimes restless. restless legs can set in and the energy is still moving because the mind is moving so much. So to do that position that Sean was saying, gently move the feet back and forth. You can do them together or one at a time but you're allowing the body to fully be supported in the movement and the noticing of the breath. To, the whole idea is to get, create more awareness in the body and a ritual of relaxation, whatever that is for you. Mm, a reclamation of space, your space. Because mm -hmm. often when we're in pain, there's, um, excessive input rather that is space. the input <laughs> <laughs> i hurt and that's that is the process of mm. yes i hurt and then create comfort around as best you can and relaxation and breath oils a cooler room at nighttime is also really helpful so the body can settle and choose one we're going to share uh, some notes with you today with all of these ideas and choose a few and see especially if you're having sleep issues because they're terrible they're terrible and i think we've all i think most everyone's experienced it and it's nice to have a little secret pouch with things you can try and see which one your body likes the best yeah if you find yourself waking up with your fists tightly held, the chances mm. are your jaw is also going to be tightly held. Um, and there's an exercise that I want to share with you that you can do to relax. Number one, take your hand and put them on a pillow so they can't go into little balls. 
But the second one is to take your tongue tip and you put it behind your teeth and then you flatten, you flatten the tongue out on the roof of your mouth. Breathe in. Just relax. Breathe a few times in and out. And on this next part, only do what is comfortable for your mouth. You should not create any kind of pain whatsoever. If it creates any pain, please stop. But this one is with the tip of your tongue, you paint the palette. You imagine painting your, your, the, the palette of your mouth, literally like a paintbrush going backwards and forwards on the roof of your mouth. On the roof of your mouth. So as you're, as you're literally taking it backwards and forwards, with each breath, you take a breath in. And on the out breath, just bring the paintbrush back, the tongue back. And when you've done that, you're going to go to the back of each tooth and really gently, literally take almost like you're polishing the teeth with your tongue. Go all the way around one side nice and slowly. And then the other side at the top of the roof of your mouth. And you take a little while to do that. That takes usually a couple of minutes. And then you bring the tongue around the outside. So it actually starts to relax your jaw. And again, brings awareness to your breath, to your body, to slowing things down. And it can be a beautiful exercise to do. I did that the other night, Linda. You had told me about it because I do have a lot of tension in my jaw. And I wear a mouth guard. If I don't wear a mouth guard, I don't sleep because I'll clench too much. That's just been something I've had my whole life for that's a story, another story. And the tendency too is the clenching of my hands. And so I, I do rest my hands on a pillow, but I did the uh, painting of the teeth and the upper part of my mouth. It was actually really helpful. It did help my jaw relax and I fell asleep because there's a lot of teeth to paint. <laughs> and I think that my, <laughs> I'm like, okay. And then I do rem I fell asleep, which was great, <laughs> but I did do it with my mouth guard in because if I don't have that in, I won't, I can't sleep. So those of you who wear a mouth guard, that was really helpful. Linda, by the way, thank you. That was a new one for me and it did work well. Brilliant. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Christy. And do we have any other questions um, that anyone would like to ask or any insights that you'd like to share based on what we've um, presented so far? So feel free to put something into the chat. Yeah, there are so many influences around sleep and, and rather than look at how do I deactivate the influence, it's also looking at how can I appreciate staying within who I am rather than complicate myself with another deterrent. Yeah, another disruption. Because um, it's about deactivating the disruptions in order to remain within who you are. Are are you asking for questions? Yes, if you've got any, any questions, we would love to hear. We would love to hear them. Yeah, I uh, my problem is kind of uh, a little bit different. I uh, I had a knee replacement, and uh, and so it was very difficult for me to sleep at night. Mm. And you know, I take pain pills, you know, to take care of the pain, and and so. Uh, Laying down to go to sleep at night was there was a lot of anxieties there because I knew I was not going to be able to go to sleep because of the situation. <laughs> sure. And so yeah. and so that's kind of stayed with me, and and you know it's getting a little bit less and less, but it's been about a year. But uh, mm. so I find that when when bedtime comes around, I start getting these anxieties that uh, mm. uh, you know my my knee doesn't necessarily hurt at the time, but uh, 
something's going on to where it's not allowing me to I'm kind of afraid of it. <laughs> I'm yeah. afraid to open the door to get punched in the nose again because I just it's just uh, isn't working. But anyhow, that's kind of a kind of different. With some of the things that we've shared already, um, what I would suggest if you could play with some of the techniques. But what I'm hearing you say is like you're you're stressed before you go to bed, so you're actually setting up a process of um, expectation. Um, so I would suggest that maybe you look at how could your body feel more supported within that process and setting up the pillows in such a way that you've got the feeling of physical support. Um, and again, really, um, looking at how you can calm the body, maybe with some of the suggestions we've made, essential oils, bath, something that's going to, um, allow the body to go, it's okay. I'm going to relax. And to breathe into that area, to be very present with that area and um, know that from the last year that you've had, it's been very difficult, but also start to trust that you're seeing improvements. Those improvements are going to continue. So to really spend some time letting yourself know this is a space of time where you're at now, it's not going to be where you are in the future and your breath and awareness into those areas whilst bringing some lighter energy will help that healing process. And one okay. other thing I would suggest for that is clients of mine that have had knee replacements, there's a great, um, it's a red light therapy band that are inexpensive. The process of taking care of your knee before bed, so either to put a band on or to put oils on, and this may sound ridiculous, however, and, but to tell your knee that you are taking care of your knee and you hear it and you feel it, put something around it, making it comfortable, and then doing one of the exercises will be helpful because your knee is taking up all the space. So it needs some attention, yes, and give it some attention, tell it, thank you for working, give it some love, and then do an exercise to calm the mind. That's what I would suggest because you're doing, you're going to do two things, the recognition of it, and then something that helps your mind let go of it. And please try it for 30 days a pain cream, a red light therapy band, a nice soft pillow, a heating pad, whatever it feels best to you. Okay, and Sean has just put a response into Laura's question. Laura's question was, what do you mean by hold on to emotions when you talk about the bladder? Sean has written, hi, Laura, all emotions have a cycle. And we are required to witness and at times participate with them. They have beautiful content for us about ourselves. It's just like having a conversation until completion, which is called pace. And I'll just add to that as well. Like when we're afraid of our emotions, then sometimes you're going to find that um, the fear itself in much the same way as we might witness in animals that are afraid or, or children that are scared, um, the emotions really represent things like fear, things that we might be concerned by. It can be worry, it can be anxiousness, but it represents an emotion. So by continually going to the bathroom, you're not being with the part of you that's afraid or scared or worried or anxious. Mm -hmm. It's like um, you're just wanting to maybe get rid of that. And we hear that in the language. I just want to get rid of it. Whereas mm -hmm. in psychosomatics and when we talk about the body and the emotions, even if there are emotions we don't like, the body doesn't like getting rid of emotions. It likes to integrate emotions. So that is the holding pattern that Sean's referring to as well. Um, what do you, when you say integrate emotions, can you just elaborate? Because I'm very new to this work. So oh. um, yeah. 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 So the integration of emotions is like, to actually experience the feeling of what the emotion is rather than try to keeping yourself busy, 
Um, often people will be very busy all the time to avoid emotions. So literally allowing an emotion to be there. And in psychosomatics, we often say, if you're going to be sad, do sad well. And it's like, if I was with a sad child, I would hug that child. But sometimes when a sadness might come up in a person, they want to get rid of it. So it's just changing the relationship with the emotion itself. And it is one of the four, one of the really basics, I should say, of psychosomatics to learn how to be with your emotional field, not to judge it, but to start to notice it, to witness it, to be kind and gentle with whatever that is. So that is the integration. Yeah. And it. I also would say that these practices that we've talked about today, you will start to notice what that is when you slow down the mind and come into the body, the emotions will be there and they can be across the board, different ones, but you're going to begin to notice that they're there. And that is the practice and allow yourself to be with them and invitations into what it is they mean. And that's really why we're here too doing these calls is to get you more familiar with that conversation about different parts of the body and what different parts mean with psychosomatics and our bodies are our medicine. They, they do know how to work. They know how to rest. They know how to perform and, and they tell us work. which bits were no longer interacting with or feeling challenged with interaction. Yes. And to create, have curiosity about that. What is it that might need to have some more attention and love towards that so there is better integration the of body the emotions is a being held? Phenomenal processing vehicle. Yes. Even though the mind may be terrified by what the body is going through, um, when you allow the body to move through the process, it teaches the mind what the body can do rather than our headspace um, commanding that limitation around what's possible in my body. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to finish today with um, just, it's a Tanran inspired uh, message um, sort of changed a little bit from the tr traditional uh, Tanran Reiki saying, but just want you to sit back, listen to this, and see if you could apply it. Just for tonight, I let go of worry. Just for tonight, I let go of anger. Just for tonight, I release my fears. Just for tonight, I release sadness. Just for tonight, I release grief. Just for tonight, I am kind to myself. Just for tonight, I connect with the feelings of gratitude. Just for tonight. Thank you, Linda. I love that. Thank you for everyone for coming today. Thank you, everyone.